So uh, shall we shall we get started? It's three minutes past two. Um, so uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining the first underwater acoustics monthly webinar from uh, from UCAN. Um, that's organised by the early career coordination team, which is myself, uh, Nikhil, Roslyn, and Ben and Ford. Um, so today we've got speaking uh, Sophie Nedelec and Joe Garrett. Uh, Sophie is going to be talking about uh, particle motion soundscapes, uh, and Joe's talking about the sonic kayak. Um, and I think without further ado, I will pass on to Sophie. Okay, sure. Thanks, Ben. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Great. Um, if anyone has any issues seeing or hearing whatever's going on, please just put your hand up and let me know because I can't I can't see your wonderful faces or hear your voices unless you kind of put yourselves forward. So let's go for that. So yeah, thanks for having me here today. It's a great pleasure to be here at the very first of these types of webinars. So thanks for inviting me. As Bender said, I'm Sophie Nedelec. I'm at the University of Exeter. I'm a postdoctoral researcher there. And my work focuses on pressure and particle motion. I look at underwater sound, and I also look at the impacts of anthropogenic sound, primarily on coral reef fishes. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about some of that work today. Um, I need to start off by acknowledging of my co-authors and funders who all make this work possible, but not just possible, but enjoyable. And um, there's too many of them to mention here, but thankfully this is being recorded. So if you need to click back to this at any point, then you can. Um, so here's a little outline of my talk for today. I'm gonna start off by going right back to the start and having a think about what is sound. And I'm really aware that um, I am by background a biologist and I'm probably in this webinar with people who are by background acousticians. So it'll be really interesting to hear um, the views of people that are here um, and whether we are actually all aligned in our definitions of sound. Uh, so then I'm gonna go on to talk about pressure versus particle motion. I'm gonna talk about particle motion from the perspective of a biologist trying to understand what it is and why it's relevant to the world. Um, and one of the solutions I've been working on recently with collaborators is writing a best practice guide for how to measure and report particle motion. Then to try and bring that into the context, I'll go a little bit into some of my work on the impacts of noise on coral reef fishes and end with some of the solutions that we're looking into in terms of how to mitigate some of those negative effects. So to start off with what is sound, is there anyone who can volunteer what they what their definition of sound is? I'd really like to hear from you. Either you can put it in the chat or raise your hand or just unmute your microphone and say something I would love to hear. What is sound? I feel like we should know this. <laughs> is anyone going to say anything? No, we're having <laughs> no one coming forward. Okay, so all right, I'll give you the the definition. Oh, wait, here we go. Someone's put something in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> Sound is alterate. This is Krista Young. Sound is alteration in pressure, stress, or material displacement propagated by the action of elastic stresses in an elastic medium, and that involves local compression and expansion of the medium, or the superposition of such propagated alterations. Fantastic! Thank you for that expert definition. Great. Um, and so. That's from the ISO 18405, which is an international standard. And I've taken a snippet out of that for um, thinking myself about how I define sound at the moment. Um, so I sound is a disturbance in a compressible elastic medium that propagates the local compressions and expansions of the medium. Okay, so um, 
the reason why I wanted to start from here is that there's a very common misconception that I come across when people are thinking about pressure and particle motion underwater, which is that for some reason you only get particle motion when you're near the source, when you're in the Lots of people seem to think that particle motion is only really an issue that you need to consider when you're in the field. Um, but actually, when you think about what sound is, it has to be particles moving for there to be any sound. You can't have sound if there isn't particle motion. Um, so this is a plane wave example. So we're thinking about sound in the far field here. Um, the animation from Don Russell. Um, it's showing a wave that's propagating from left to right and you can see that all of the particles involved in this wave are vibrating from left to right. They're not travelling from left to right with the travelling wave but they're oscillating around a point in space and as those particles get closer together you have an um, increase in pressure and as those particles get further apart from each other you have a reduction in pressure so you have these fluctuations. And in this plane wave scenario, it is true that the particle motion is really easy, easily relatable to the pressure. So there's this very simple relationship, which is U or velocity is equal to the pressure divided by rho C, which is the characteristic impedance of the medium. So everywhere that we have sound, we have particle motion. That's basically the point of this slide. But what is happening when we're in slightly more complicated situations? Um, why do people worry more about particle motion when you're in the near field? What does that actually mean? Um, and this is my biologist's attempt at explaining this. So essentially, when you're in the near field of a simplified sound source, like a monopole, that would be a sphere that's expanding and contracting in all directions equally at once, like in this lovely animation from Dan Russell. You can still um, calculate the particle motion from the pressure. It's just a little bit more complicated. And there's a very complicated equation here, um, which shows um, how you do that. And I'm not going to go into this in great detail. I expect you to, um, to grasp this entire equation just from looking at it. All I want you to understand is that you can calculate it. It's just more complicated. Um, but also that there's these two additive terms in there. We've got a cos term and a sine term. And um, cos and sine are 90 degrees out of phase with one another. So that's in quadrature. And they're additive, these two terms. So this is basically describing that when we're in the near field of a monopole source, there's extra particle motion. And that particle motion is phase shifted by 90 degrees compared to the pressure because that cos term is describing the pressure and the sine term is describing some particle motion and that sine term is decreasing as r which is the distance from the source is increasing so as you get further and further from the source that is that is dropping off and eventually you get to a distance from the source but that has dropped off so far that you can treat it as zero and when that's happening you can cancel out all the other things in the equation actually and revert back to that plane wave approximation that's really simple that I just showed you on the last slide. So uh, when you're in the near field of a monopole source that's when you have this additional particle motion. And um, how do we know whether we're in the near field or not? Well it's dependent on the frequency um, and this figure, this graph above, um, is showing you that relationship between frequency and wavelength. So when we're one wavelength from the source, that's when we say that we're in the far field and that's when you can start treating that um, second term as zero. And um, from this plot, you can see that basically if you're thinking about frequencies lower than a thousand hertz, and if you're thinking about distances from the source that are less than hundred meters, as a rule of thumb for when you start, need to consider whether you're in the near field or not. Um, so you can see that relationship there. But plane waves and monopoles are approximations, they're simplifications of real world scenarios and how often are they really the case? Um, often sources are more complicated. Um, so this is an example of a dipole, that's something moving backwards and forwards like this. And 
you can see from this representation of it that you're getting destructive interference above and below that sound source, which is cancelling out destructively interfering. The sound is destructively interfering with itself. Um, so you start to have different relationships around this monopole. So when you have a more complex source or you have multiple sources producing sound and the waves are interfering with each other, or if you have reflections of sound waves, either from the surface or the bottom, and they're interfering with themselves, then you start to see interference patterns, which make these calculations even more difficult. There's also something called the cutoff frequency, which is a depth below which um, frequencies will not propagate. So um, the sound will drop off exponentially with distance from the source. And you can see there's a figure here that's showing the relationship between the cutoff frequency and the depth. And that blue area is where you need to start being concerned about the cutoff frequency affecting the sound. And again, you can see it's below a thousand hertz and it depths of meters that you need to start considering this. All of these um, realities start to make calculations a lot more difficult and it means that it's advisable to measure the particle motion instead of the pressure. But hang on a minute, I've got to start getting into all of these details. Where's the real world? Why do we care about the particle motion anyway? Why does any of this matter? Um, and so actually the majority of the ears in the ocean are hearing particle motion um, and that's the fishes and the invertebrates primarily. And also those ears are located in places where those interference patterns are most likely to be more complicated. So they're near the surface, they're near the bottom, they're in the shallow water. And um, those ears are hearing and using sound in a whole variety of ways. Lots of them are actually communicating. They might be producing sounds and listening to each other. They might be looking for mates. They might be looking for habitat that they need to settle on. And all of that makes them vulnerable to effects of noise. Um, so knowing about the particle motion for that reason is important. It's not just about hearing though, and the actual um, particle motion itself could be causing injury to tissues, whether any animals are hearing it or not. So it's quite possible that strain from particle displacement on elastic tissues can get to an extent that it can actually damage those tissues. And that means that the actual maximum levels of the particle motion matter. And so it's a problem if you can't predict the particle motion levels from the pressure alone, if you're not able to measure the particle motion. So there's a reason why it's important to measure it. And finally, just it's really interesting that because particle motion is a vector, um, this movement backwards and forwards on an axis, or potentially it, there can be more complicated motions, uh, um, elliptical or other shapes. Um, by measuring the particle motion in one place, you can actually determine the direction that the sound is coming from. And if you're working in, for example, coral reef environment, where you might have many different um, animals around you making noises, and being able to localize where each of those is, it starts to add a real depth of information to soundscapes that you can understand. But it can also add to our understanding about masking because for example, in fishes, they have on their sensory epithelium that overlays their ear bone, their otolith, the hair cells that are actually detecting the particle motion are orientated in different directions. So if there's a boat coming from that direction, it's activating hair cells over here, it's quite possible that that might not be masking a vocalization from another fish that's coming from this direction. There's actually different hair cells that are being activated by the sounds from those two different directions. And that's something that we can think about in theory, but haven't been able to test yet. So that's a really exciting potential future avenue for research in particle motion. Uh, so now I'm going to show you some examples of um, actual measurements that Five Bit Out done. Um, here's a few pictures of me going out and measuring particle motion. Some of that's been in the very, very glamorous location of the key down in Exeter. Um, some as that has been in the Bahamas. And you can see we did recordings in the day and in the nighttime. We stayed up all night <laughs> to get the um, 
all the way through the night and um, sometimes in the rain too. Um, I'm not going to be showing you data from all of these expeditions, but um, this is just to give you a bit of a flavour for the kinds of fieldwork that I've been involved in. It's often in quite challenging environments and habitats. So in that top right picture, you can see that the water is really shallow and the environment's really complex. And trying to predict how sound might be propagating in that type of environment could be really, really challenging. So making those measurements is really important there. Um, how do we analyse the sound? So there's a paper that was published as part of my PhD research um, in Methods in Ecology and Evolution. It's reached 100 citations yesterday, which is pretty exciting. So hopefully that's actually been a useful paper for the field. Um, in that paper, as an attachment, um, like an appendices, we provided a a computer program for analysing the data that comes from triaxial accelerometers. Um, and there was a need for that because these accelerometers have frequency specific calibrations. And so our computer program is really kind of solving, making it easy for people how to, how to calibrate that data. And um, with James Campbell, I'm actually working on a second version of that at the moment. And hopefully that is going to be available soon. There is, in fact, a working prototype that um, is on the go at the moment. And so if there are any people who would like to be guinea pigs that want to kind of road test this because they have some data they want to analyse and they're happy to kind of send us back information about bugs in it, then that could, that could be quite useful. Just let me know. Um, Let's talk about some actual data. Um, you know, I was talking about this misconception that particle motion is only a thing in the near field. Well, we have some data showing that that's not the case. Um, so here we've got recordings of motorboat noise that were made off a beach on Lizard Island. Um, the depth of the water is about a metre. So you'd expect the sound to not be propagating very well, most of the sound to be below the cutoff, right? Um, and we took recordings of ambient background noise and then recordings at 20, 50, 100, 175 and 250 metres from that boat. And on this figure here, you can see the sound pressure level in green and the particle acceleration level in turquoise. And this is for the frequency range 100 hertz to 2000 hertz. And um, what you can see is obviously the the sound level goes up quite dramatically when you're very close to the boat and then it drops off, but it doesn't drop off to ambient noise levels, even at 250 metres in particle motion. I realised that the level does appear to be 103 for the pressure, but actually when you it's, it's not exactly 103 and when you listen to it, you can still hear the boat. And I'm going to play you a little clip. This is the particle motion of a boat at 250 meters. There we go. So there is particle motion in the far field. Um, and yeah, just to be sure that we are in the far field and um, the wavelength of uh, yeah, a, a sound that has a wavelength of 250 meters would be six hertz, and we're only looking here above 100 hertz. So we're definitely talking up and down. So there we go. Why isn't it letting me click on my thing now? Okay, so um, here's a small plug for the best practice guide I've been working on with these wonderful people um, in order to try and help people in the field to make really good measurements of particle motion. We've been writing a best practice guide. The interim version was available last August and the final version should be available this August. Um, and in there, we talk about what to look for in an instrument, how to use an instrument, how to calibrate an instrument, how to analyze the data and how to report the data. Okay, so What's, what's actually happening in the real world and what's the effect of these, um, of these sounds that are being put into coral reef environments. And I'm just gonna give you a really brief overview of some of the coral reef research I've been involved in. So yeah, here's a map of boat activity.
activity around Lizard Island on the Great Barrier Reef where we've done a lot of our research. And this is an extract from Jamie McWilliams' um, PhD thesis. So he put GPS receivers on um, research vessels and then tracked them for months. And this is the result. So where you've got a deeper red colour, that's where there's a lot more boat activity. And as, as it cools down, that's less activity. Um, but what you can really gather from this figure is that even on a very quiet island with very few inhabitants, and this is in a really protected area, so members of the public um, need to get a permit if they want to go and do certain activities there. It's actually quite a lot of the reef that's exposed to boat noise. And um, when you consider that the noise from those boats is propagating, at least 250 meters. That's actually close to the reef around the island being exposed to noise. And um, from our research, which has mostly been around the island, we have shown that the noise pollution is affecting all parts of the life cycle of coral reef fishes that are there. So we see reduced recruitment, failure to notice predators, which leads to an impact on survival. We see failure to learn about predators also leads to an impact on survival. Um, when fish grow up and they start to get parasites, usually they'd be cleaned by cleaner wrasse, but that relationship is disrupted by noise. Um, when you start to look at development, um, it's, as we see that eggs will fail to develop if they're in noisy conditions. And um, finally, at the parental care stage of life, we see that fish start being bad parents when they're annoyed by noise, and that actually leads to their nests producing fewer offspring. So in general, noise is bad news for reefs. But there are solutions and there are things that we're working on at the moment. Um, there's a whole array here. Um, we looked at switching engine types from two stroke to four stroke and that reduces the amount of noise that they're making and it leads to less stress in fish and embryos. Um, some really effective behavioural measures for boat drivers are to just avoid driving close to reefs or decrease the speed if they're near to reefs. There are technical things about the propellers and motors such as the pitch of the propeller, that's like the angle of the um, blades on the propeller that actually affects how much um, acceleration the boat gets. So it doesn't just affect how much noise it makes, but it affects how quickly the boat has gone past and is stopped being a disturbance. Um, electric motors will be much quieter and that's an avenue we're looking to go down in the near future. Um, but then on the more human side, there's things to be done as well. So one of those things is to raise awareness in people that noise is an issue underwater. And the other is then to influence policy that means that behaviour will start to be regulated. And in the raising awareness category, we had something I've been working on in the last Sonic Kayak. Um, so I've been building one of these. Um, and the people who use this can experience the underwater world in a sensory way and I'm gonna leave it here because I know that Joe is gonna talk a, um, a bit more about the sonic kayak. I would just say thanks very much for listening and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much Sophie, um, yeah that was really interesting. Um, I think we're going to leave questions until the end uh, and then do all of our questions and discussion as as more of a um, yeah more of a discussion session at the end. So uh, if anyone does have any questions, um, please either whack them in the chat or the Q and A, uh, or write them down and you can raise a hand later on, and uh, and you can ask them with your voice. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, without further ado, we'll. Um, We'll move on to Joe. So if you'd like to share your screen, I'll let you know that it's working. Brilliant, thank you. Okay. How's that? That's fab. All right, thank you very much, Joe. Okay, so um, I'm Dr. Joe Garrett. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the European Centre for Environment and Human Health, also at the University of Exeter. 
Um, I have had a varied research journey. I studied marine biology um, at undergraduate level, uh, and my PhD was in underwater sound in Falmouth Bay in Cornwall, where I investigated the shipping noise in the bay and noise from a wave energy converter that was being tested there. But I graduated from my PhD around five years ago now, um, and since then I have worked mainly on the links between the environment and human health with a focus on the links between blue spaces and well-being. So my underwater acoustics may be a little rusty. Um, today I'm going to talk about a project I've been involved with uh, called the Sonic Kayaks. The Sonic Kayak system was developed by Foam Kerno, a non-profit arts and science organisation based in Penryn in Cornwall. Uh, the Sonic Kayak, Sonic Kayak was developed from Sonic Bikes, an art installation created by a sound artist called Kath Matthews in collaboration with Dave Griffiths, now at Foam Kerno. The bikes have speakers attached to the handlebars and cyclists hear GPS triggered sound pieces through the speakers while cycling around a city, for example. So the system detects whether the cyclist has gone into range of a pre-specified location and it plays a sound associated with that location. Sonic bike bikes have been installed around the world and can be found in multiple European countries this summer. And the sound pieces triggered can be anything from music to a story. So Foam Kerno developed this sonic bike system to be used on a kayak with the addition of also collecting scientific data. They held an open hackathon where scientists, sound artists and coders could all come together and contribute their ideas and expertise to developing the system. Uh, and this is how the Sonic Kayak was created. The Sonic Kayaks were launched at the British Science Festival in 2016 in Swansea, UK. Anyone could sign up and take part in the session, uh, which is pictured here. And since they were launched, the Son Sonic Kayaks have been uh, redesigned and this is the current configuration. Uh, the whole system is designed to be as low cost as possible and open source. So circled is um, a waterproof box which contains all the electronics and I'll come back to the specifics. But this nicely fits in the back of the kayak in the storage bit you often find in sit on top sea kayaks and as uh, demonstrated by Sophie. The system includes a waterproof Bluetooth speaker which is uh, cylindrical in shape and this I find nicely fits in the water bottle holder in front of the paddler. There's a custom rig uh, constructed out of webbing with a water turbidity sensor which measures water cloudiness and this is designed and made, uh, made by Foam Kerno and it's designed to stick out the side of the kayak uh, as you paddle so that the paddler can lift it out of the water if needed and a temperature sensor is also attached to this rig. Also attached to the waterproof box is a air pollution sensor um, which you can see larger here. It's a little 3D printed box which houses the air pollution sensor with two little nozzles to let air in and out um, while trying to keep it as waterproof as possible. The hydrophone is relatively inexpensive that we use, although it's still one of the most expensive parts of the kit. Um, it's a Dolphin Ear Pro and has a sampling frequency of 44 kilohertz. It's attached to the waterproof box um, on a long cable, which is mostly wrapped up but dangles uh, over the back of the kayak at about one meter depth. Uh, so here's the close up of the electronics box. The kit is now a lot tidier than it used to be, all slotted into a custom uh, wooden mold and the electronics are not really my area of expertise um, but it's all designed to be open hardware and open source and you can find all the details on the Sonic Kayak wiki on github including details of all the hardware, instructions of how to make it, the code and a list of all the tools you'd need. The system is based on a Raspberry Pi and the box also houses the GPS um, preamp for the hydrophone, which is where the hydrophone is connected, um, and the hydrophone data is amplified for listening while paddling, but can be stored without being amplified. Also has a USB uh, power bank, uh, sound card, and an Arduino Nano, which is there to interface with the other sensors. Um, just to recap, those are the underwater temperature sensor, water turbidity, and air pollution, in addition to the hydrophone. 
And I will talk, be talking a bit about all the different aspects, but obviously focusing on the underwater sound. Um, the total cost is about £1,100, uh, assuming access to a 3D printer and tools. And here's a kit uh, all set up on a kayak. Um, so you've got the speaker at the front there and the water turbidity and temperature sensors, the electronics box nicely in the back with the air pollution sensor and the hydrophone cable coming off the back of the kayak. And the system is designed, it should be able to go on any kayak. You just need to be able to kind of strap it in. Similar to the Sonic bikes, the Sonic kayaks were developed to also include location triggered sounds as you paddle into a range of a pre-specified location or areas, the GPS on the system tells the onboard computer to play a certain sound through the speakers. And this map shows hail uh, in West Cornwall and the boxes indicate uh, the location of the sounds. So as you paddle into one of these areas, the associated sound then plays. And in this location, we are exploring the potential use as like a heritage tour where information snippets about the immediate location would then play. So as you paddle around, you can not only hear the underwater sounds directly and any location triggered sounds, the data from the sensors are sonified as well or converted into sound so that you can also hear other details about the environment. Now to have constant sound was found to be kind of too annoying. Um, so the information from the sensors are sonified when there's a change in the environment. The water turbidity and air pollution sensors are recent additions um, and there's quite a lot going on now. As well as being sonified, the data is also stored on a USB stick. Okay, I'm going to play a video now. Um, I know that videos can often be jumpy over Zoom, but it's mainly the sound. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to hear that okay. Right. She says. The sonifications were designed by Kath Matthews and we used an online survey to pick which sonifications people found the easiest to interpret. Um. So, so that's the sonifications, really. So you can hear a clicking sound, which speeds up. That's the air pollution. The temperature sensor is the sort of woo noise and the deeper, bassier sound is the water turbidity. I think I've got that right. Um, so last summer, we had proposed to test out the sonic kayak with groups to explore its potential for engaging citizen science with the under scientists with underwater environment. Unfortunately, COVID-19 prevented us from from carrying out our plans. Nevertheless, um, the research and development team, we took it out and uh, we tested it in the Helford in early August, which is a flooded river valley on the south coast of Cornwall near Falmouth. Falmouth Bay experiences a considerable level of shipping, although uh, less so recently, but normally there would be shipping traffic, uh, cruise ships, fishing, tourism, and recreational boating. The Helford, however, um, is typically thought of as quiet, clean and beautiful, attracting holiday makers and leisure craft users, uh, particularly yachts and kayaks. And the locations include uh, the, ha uh, the habitat eelgrass, which are features protected within the Fallon Helford Special Area of Conservation designation. And just a close up version of uh, the map of the area for testing and to note that the maximum depth here is approximately 10 metres at high tide. The red marker points out the Helford estuary in the location of the test, while Falmouth is in the north of the map and Falmouth Bay is to the east of the red marker. You might have already guessed already that paddling noise is problematic if you want to hear and analyse other sounds. Um, so we're going to have a go at playing a clip. I'll play that again. This is without paddling. 
and then with Padme. Um, so it's in a broad frequency range from around one to six kilohertz and the loudest is around two kilohertz. Um, so we made a use of the GPS triggered sounds and preloaded the sonic kayak map system with markers to play a sound every 200 meters or so as a reminder to stop paddling and allow recording of samples free from paddling noise. Uh, and that's this we analyzed. Um, so we recorded paddle free samples of about 60 seconds. So I've talked a bit about the development and the data collection, and I'm going to talk about um, how I've analysed it so far. Um, so we've got our paddling free segments, samples, but to analyse them, I need to be able to select the data I want. Um, to do this, I've been doing the fairly manual process of listening to the sound file that's stored in five minute chunks and making a note of the start and finish time of the paddle free sections I want for later analysis. And this is just using Audacity, the free uh, sound software. Uh, so I analyse the clips of interest in R using a custom script, um, which analyses only the paddle free clips um, based on the open source code in PAM guide. I attempted a whole system uh, calibration with the help of Dave Griffiths by recording sine waves of known voltage through the whole system. So that's the preamp, the sound card and the Raspberry Pi and with the hydrophone sensitivity provided by the manufacturer. <clears throat> oh, although the hydrophone has been in use for a while and not properly calibrated, but in theory, this should provide us with the uh, absolute sound levels. Okay, so here's the Helford and the route taken on the test. Um, so the sound power values per one second were passed to the mapping script and averaged over space in the hex bins. So the time represented by each hex bin can vary and the sound levels were converted to decibels as the final step. And the figure shows the broadband sound levels of the, in the frequency range 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz. And the sound levels are highest as the kayaker paddles uh, across the river where the hex bins are colored yellow. Uh, this is for the 125 hertz third octave band. Um, and as a reminder, while Farmers Bay experiences considerable shipping, the Helford is mainly visited by small recreational boats, yachts, and paddle boarders. It's also quite shallow. And just to point out that the values of the color scale vary uh, with the minimum and maximum represented on each map automatically. Um, so here the maximum values is 189 decibels not 189 decibels, 89 decibels. Um, and you can see it's generally quiet with a loud sound on the south side of the river. And the results from the one kilohertz third octave level, um, you can see at this frequency range, it's louder in the middle section of the river with a maximum third octave level of around 97 decibels. And again, for the frequency band 10 kilohertz, um, again, pretty loud across the river with a maximum value of around 86 decibels here. For me, these two third octave bands highlight the contribution of the higher frequencies in this shallow area, where the contribution of low frequency commercial shipping is limited, but the contribution of smaller rec recreational vessels is more prominent. Okay, so what do we think this might be useful for? The system facilitates collection of fine scale temperature data in coastal waters um, and estuaries and rivers in particular, as these areas are likely to be visited by recreational kayakers. These locations are highly variable, for example, due to tides. Um, because these sites are so variable, it's hard to get an accurate picture of what's going on, for example, from satellites, which may only pass every few days. And this type of information can be useful in the research of harmful algal blooms and climate change. And harmful algal blooms are where there is an unusually large population of algae or plankton, which contains toxins harmful to humans or animals. And for example, this can be a problem with shellfish farming, um, which happens in the Helford and, and around the fall. Air pollution is re recognised as a public health issue on land, but the contribution from shipping uh, in coastal areas is less recognised, and we know very little about the exposure to water users. This is the cruise ship um, called The World, and we detected relatively high levels of air pollution to the north of this ship, 
which was consistent with the wind direction from the south during the test uh, in Falmouth Bay. Um, <clears throat> that is only one example, of course, we'd need to explore this further. And potential uses for the water turbidity include the monitoring of water quality, including around seaweed, shellfish or fish farms, monitoring of half algal blooms again, sewage outflows and farm runoff. And with the sound, with such fine scale underwater data, um, it may be possible for environmental managers to use the data to inform management, such as reduce speed in certain areas or limiting areas boats can use, or some of the other measures Sophie suggested. Uh, this system could be used to monitor underwater anthropogenic noise pollution, complementing monitoring from the static and drifting recorders. The paddler can choose where to go and sample, and while uh, we had the suggested sampling reminders. You can also stop and record if you hear something interesting through the speakers. It's also possible that the system could be used to monitor biological sounds and new sounds from animals as a measure of biodiversity. I'll be happy to hear from anyone who would like to discuss this or advise. Um, I'd be particularly interested in using this approach to monitor the mill beds, uh, the algae mill uh, in Falmouth and all the seagrass beds that we have. But it's real power, I think, is for citizen science, uh, like Sophie said, um, for engaging people with the underwater world. For example, you can really hear the loudness of the boats underwater with this system. Sometimes you can hear them coming before you can see them. Citizens and groups can potentially collect data of interest to them and lobby for changes to management in their area. There are limitations, of course. Kayaking would be predominantly limited to daylight and good weather conditions. Um, and we recommend that the sensor systems, in particular, the air and more pollution and water turbidity, should be used for approximate relative data mapping rather than gathering absolute values that would be necessary for certain regulatory or research applications. But for professional researchers or those seeking data sky policy, and for citizen scientists, the system can be of particular use for gathering data to inform the design of more precise secondary studies. In the future, the team at FOAM are thinking about making an off-the-shelf version and developing an online mapping system which citizen scientists can contribute to. There's also the potential for onboard data processing. And the idea of the Sonic Hike is to be user-friendly and to engage you know, everyone with the underwater world, but the underwater acoustics data is probably most technically challenging. So if anyone has ideas about how we can improve these things, you know, I'll be happy to hear about it um, or any ideas about any of the aspects I've talked about. I'm sure there must be better ways of clipping out the paddling noise, for example. Um, you can find out more information on the foam website, which you can find by googling foam kernel sonic kayak, including the full length video from the work we did last year, which I played a clip from, link to the latest preprint, um, and uh, that preprint also describes the sound data I presented. So, um, thank you to listening. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to hear any feedback, ideas, and, and questions. Um, thank you to uh, the people who worked on this, particularly Amber and Dave Griffiths from foam kernel. And I'm very interested to find out from Sophie exactly how she got on with making one and um, any tests she's tried. Thanks very much, Jo. Um, shall we uh, shall we go straight to Sophie and and, uh, and see what she's got to say about um, about using the Sonic Pack? Yes, please. Uh, you're muted, Sophie. Hi. There you go. Hello. Thank you. Um, I've got some pictures of uh, my experience of making it. Um, there we go. It was a great um, escape from my kitchen into a virtual and a technological world during lockdown for me doing this project. Um, so I think it took about eight to ten training sessions um, in terms of days of working on it. And um, the way that we did that was by video link. So there was me and Amber and Dave Griffiths. And yeah, it was a great experience. I had loads of fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, learned loads of new skills um, and learned new things to do with some skills that I had before. Um, 
found new ways of using various things I could find around my kitchen as well. Uh, so it was fun. So there we go. There's some pictures of me building it. <laughs> um, it's not it's not fully finished and working yet. I've got to redo the turbidity sensor, but I do know how to do that now. So yeah. And do you have plans to to take it out once you once you've finished? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's some sound artists. Well, there's a sound artist from Bristol I've met who's really interested in it, and um, a an eco artist I could say uh, that does the Tidelines project in Exmouth. He's really interested as well. And there's some mussel beds in um, in the ex estuary that it would be really great to be able to explore with this. Um, with the Tidelines project, there's some really good links with. There are kind of wild swimming groups. There's about 50 people that go swimming in the accessory every day who are really interested in the water quality around the local area. Um, so I think that would be a really nice way of engaging with them. Um, and there's also people who are concerned, local people concerned about the, um, the mussel beds with, uh, there's a new seawall that's been built and that's affecting the sedimentation and potentially affecting the the mussel beds so it'd be really interesting to see whether we can because the water is really turbid it's really brown in the estuary so if we can detect where those mussels are whether the habitat's been silted up or not acoustically then that'd be really interesting yeah that sounds really interesting um cool. joe we have a we have a question for you um can the sonic kayak system measure salinity or conductivity um, no, it doesn't yet, but um, I mean, there's no reason why not if these things can be produced. Um, the, as I said, the air pollution and water turbidity sensors are recent additions. Previously, we had the temperature and the hydrophone, and then the um, turbidity and air pollution were added because they were requests from people. So in theory, you can add, if they can be built, you can add them on um, it's just limited by the number of connections to the to the system. So you might want to pick a mix which sensors you had at any one time. And as well with the sonification, um, they had a survey to try and ask people, you know, what, because we've got three sounds going on now, uh, air pollution, water temperature and turbidity. So that's quite a lot going on at once. Again, you probably wouldn't want any more to listen to. Yeah. So I had a question about the the sonification, particularly of the um, listening to the underwater soundscape. Um, I suppose given the hydrophone you have and the um, the sample rates, that um, that's sort of chosen presumably because that's that, that gives you the most of human. Well, probably a, a little bit more than human hearing. Um, have you considered what you could do if you increased the sample rates and sort of squashed the um, squashed the signals to make them? No, it would be uh, it would be audible. the opposite, wouldn't it? To to make those higher frequencies audible, is there is there anything that would be interesting to hear um, that that we wouldn't be able to without doing that? Um, I think there are a couple of potential uses. So, for example, we're not getting all the sounds from dolphins and porpoises. Um, not that we have come across those and that in particular in, in the lo shallow locations there's not that many of, of those but if you're exploring other areas and that could be potentially of interest and also um, the acoustic deterrent devices on, on fish nets and also sonar as well so we're missing a few high frequency sounds which would be interesting to hear. Um, I think it does have limitation well it does have potential problems or challenges in doing that because of the increase in cost of a hydrophone, um, the increase in power consumption required, um, and the increase in data storage required as well for anything higher frequency. So yeah, that is something um, that we could consider, but would have potential challenges. But I hadn't thought about the making the sound audible. That would be cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, uh, you often see people um, playing 
spectrograms with a with a line that that goes across. Um, but I have, I don't know how you would be able to do it live. Um, I've never seen anyone anyone do that. Mm. Uh, whether that is is possible or not. But back, back, back detectors must do something like that, right? I don't know. I've never used a back detector, but you can. If anyone, I don't know if anyone's used a back detector. <laughs> There's a comment exactly oh. at the same time. <laughs> back detectors do. <laughs> oh well, if if Alan Hunter knows how back detectors work, then maybe he can tell us. But yeah, so I guess it's possible. Uh, any more questions to pop it? Oh, we, we <laughs> here we go. Um, we're making maps, this is from Chris de Jong. Uh, apologies if I've got the pronunciation wrong there, Chris. Um, when making maps from kayak sound recordings, how do you incorporate temporal changes in the sound field? I'm not entirely sure I understand, um, understand that, but we've only, I don't think we've come across that problem in the sense that the, the route that I showed with the map, that was basically done once, so there was no repetition um, and we've only averaged it over space um, so yeah I don't know how we would not sure how we would tackle that multiple maps potentially representing different times or just averaging over space in the same way but then you would lose the temporal variation I don't think we've uh, I don't think we've solved that problem or come across that issue yet I guess you could make videos mm animations yeah animations yeah that would be cool. cool i noticed in one of your maps joe there was uh there was a hexagon sort of in the in the bottom right near the coast um that was sort of consistently high loud can you, yeah can you interrogate each individual hexagon to find out sort of what those sounds are uh yeah i mean you can just listen to all the sounds um it would be possible i mean to do with what we've got so far it'd be pretty manual process probably to find out exactly where and when that was but yes because we've not gone on like super long trips it's not infeasible to be able to listen to everything um, or to work out which which sound file that is, but as you got if you got more data, that would kind of thing would become more of an issue and may need to be uh, looked into. Yeah, great. Um, any further questions? We've got a few minutes remaining um, before our time slot is up. Um, uh, well, oh. <laughs> uh, can you play the output from the hydrophone through the speaker? Yeah, so as you're paddling around, the sound from the hydrophone comes through the speaker live. In general, it's quite quiet, um, just with the range and levels. Uh, but it, it, when you when a boat does go past, you can hear that that kind of thing, no problem. Um, Sophie, I had a, a question for you, talking about uh, the particle motion and uh, and strain. Is it is it known what uh, what strains um, different animal organs can sort of handle happily? Mm, no, that's a yeah, that's a big unknown and something that needs to be investigated. So that idea that um, strain can cause tissue damage actually comes from a paper that was published on um, injury to neurons in brains. Um, so in terms of what level of sound is required to cause a strain that would cause tissue damage, we don't know if that's something that needs to be investigated. Yeah, and I guess potentially is frequency dependent? Yeah, yeah, I imagine so. Well, I don't know why I'm, why I'm thinking that. Uh, we have one more for Joe. Um, any thoughts on collecting data from the various kayaks that will be recording sounds over the coming years? All the data we've collected so far is um, 
openly available. I think ideally, if we can, we'd like to have some kind of mapping system where kayakers can upload their data and then everyone can see it. And that could help us with identifying where needs to be mapped in future and monitoring temporal variations, uh, like you said before. But um, yeah, that's as far as we've got really. We would like to make a map. I have a question for Sophie. Can I say nothing? Another question? Yeah, absolutely. Have you got any future plans with particle motion research, Sophie? Um, I would, yeah, very, very, very plans. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, one thing that is going on at the moment is um, in working with some collaborators from the National Physics Laboratory and we're planning to look at the sound pressure and the particle motion emitted by various recreational craft. So um, we've got some um, a little bit of funding to try and measure source levels from various craft and then um, what we've already done actually is to measure the pressure and the particle motion from a paddleboard in comparison with an electric paddleboard and it'll be really interesting because we've done that in the typical places where you get paddleboards which is in the shallow water acoustically awkward environments and um, what we'd like to do is to start to investigate uh, where does it where's the boundary where it becomes too problematic to predict the particle motion from the pressure if you're in those awkward habitats, so using the, the source level recorded in acoustically ideal conditions and then trying to predict what the particle motion might be and then comparing that to the level that we've actually measured. So that's, that's the thing I'm working on at the moment. <laughs> Uh, I had a question, Sophie, uh, just about the, the kind of work you're doing that you're, you're leading on, yes, disseminating how to do uh, particle motion. I guess, what are the next steps for that? I, th I think a lot of people will be interested in, in reading and seeing those updates. Yeah, I'm glad to hear people would be interested in it. I mean, I hope it's useful. So, um, yeah, we're at the stage of, we, we wrote this interim best practice guide. We had a webinar where we kind of presented that and we discussed various um, elements of the decision making process about you know how do we collectively decide what we think is best practice you know as a as a global group of collaborative researchers and we're in the process of updating that interim guide based on all of the input that we had at the webinar at the moment and that should be finished like I said in August this year um, we're planning a phase two, which we're currently writing a funding application for, which is going to be to um, to go to Lake Seneca in the United States, which is like uh, the acoustically most perfect place you can get to in the world um, to bring together all the accelerometers from around the world that we can get our hands on and invite people to come with their accelerometers. Um, We'll turn up with one accelerometer that's been calibrated and then we'll do a cross calibration with all of these other ones from around the world and we'll put to the test our best practice guide to see whether it's actually useful and whether it works and whether people can actually use it and then we'll update it again based on everything and that should result in an actual standard eventually. So trying to make it as um, participatory and collaborative adventure as possible so that we can have hopefully all together as one as a as a field that you know we're all producing comparable measurements of putting these things all in the same way. Cool sounds fantastic <laughs> so yeah good luck with all of it moving forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think we are out of questions and out of time. Um, so uh, I will just uh, thank Sophie and Joe again for uh, for coming along and presenting to us. That was uh, that was really interesting. Um, and I 
if I just share my screen briefly. Um, uh, our next webinar, uh, we intended to have these um, on the last Thursday of the month, um, every month, uh, but next week is uh, UACE, the, um, uh, the Greek underwater conference, underwater acoustics conference. Um, so we'll delay by one week probably, but we'll, um, we'll confirm that. Uh, but we're having a, an overall theme of low frequency acoustics. So we have Usama Kadri uh, talking about acoustic gravity waves theory and applications, uh, and Jake Ward on uh, low frequency hydrophone calibration. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you very much again to our speakers, and um, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for having us.